Uh, welcome to another episode of Policy Talks. Uh, today we have Mr. B.G. Mahesh, who's a veteran uh, entrepreneur, uh, you know, from the dot-com era onwards. Now, of course, he's more involved and uh, engaged with the DPI ecosystems. And Rans is the co-founder and the CEO of Samati, which is an account aggregator ecosystem. And as part of our uh, uh, series of podcast into uh, DPIs, we have him here with us to talk about how does the account aggregator ecosystem work? What impact does it have? So welcome to this podcast, Mahesh. Good to have you here. Thank you, Yatish. Uh, you know, so thank you for, uh, uh, you know, actually calling Sahamati. Uh, I'm, uh, you, you know, very happy uh, to share my thoughts on this, uh, you know, huge, uh, so DPI, you know, which we strongly believe will have a huge um, impact in India. So, uh, Mahesh, you know, to begin with, uh, uh, give us a little context and background about the account aggregators. Uh, sure. So this uh, this account aggregator framework is, uh, you know, like uh, it is, you know, from the four regulators and it was published by the so Reserve Bank of India in the year of 2016. Uh, when I say, I mean, it, like, you know, it is the framework, etc. It, it came in 2016. And the yeah, technical specs of this of framework actually uh, it came in 2016. And the 19. So, what this account aggregator ecosystem or framework rather is about, it allows the customer, uh, whether it is individual uh, or you know, or a small business or a corporate, you know, they are able to share any kind of their uh, financial data with any other regulated entity. So yeah, currently when you go and apply for a loan or you go to your financial planner, the only way you are able to share your information is either you give them a hard copy of your financial data or okay, for the past 10, 15 years, you're able to send an email uh, you know, of your, uh, like actually the statements, which is the bank statements, you know, which will be password protected. And we need to also understand not everybody in India is all that, uh, you know, all that comfortable, you know, with, uh, you know, you know, to use internet banking, you know, to email the, the actually the statement, etc. Yeah. So not everybody has uh, their own financial data yeah, in their right. hands. So uh, we, you know, so the it term is that we kind of use it that they are not financially, they may Sorry. be financially independent but they are data dependent uh, on the ecosystem. On the thing. So as you can see in this whole process, for the customer, it is painful, uh, this entire process, you know, of sharing the data. And for the financial institution, there is a lot of friction in receiving the data. And then it has to be scanned, processed, OCR, and, you know, all those things. And it is not yet tamper-free the way people are getting Account aggregator actually comes there. Easiest way to explain the account aggregator, the way it works is how the UPI has removed the, the friction in making payments. Okay. Similarly, account aggregator has removed the friction in sharing your financial data. In UPI, you are able to make a payment only when the end customer gives the consent on the UPI app. In account aggregator ecosystem, only when the end customer gives the consent on the account aggregator app, the data is shared from you know your bank or your provider to the you know the service provider. So it's interesting you uh, drew an analogy between UPI and uh, account aggregators. Uh, both these entities uh, came around at the same time, you know, 2016. Uh, was when uh, UPI started. Uh, 2016 is when the permission for account aggregators uh, happened. Uh, where are we in terms of progress uh, of account aggregator in terms of adoption by the uh, financial uh, ecosystem and adoption by the Customer. individuals? Yeah. So if you see that even though the, uh, the actual policy 
you know uh, which uh, came into 2016 as i said only uh, uh, the, you know the first set of account aggregator licenses operating licenses were given only in in uh, 2019 so it is only in 2020 even though it was the pandemic year by the end of 2020 it actually went live and by you know by 2022 end of june all the public sector banks you know went live so now we have like about 300 and odd entities which are you know, on the account aggregator ecosystem all the all the 12 yeah, public sector banks are on AA. All the so top private banks are, are on AA. Already few insurance companies are on have come uh, on this. So the uh, the uh, the amount of data uh, shares which have uh, happened, you know, it has already crossed, you know, approximately, you know, uh, so twelve crores. So I mean. Uh, so 1.2 crores, I'm sorry, uh, you know, 12 million. Uh, the, the amount of consents, you know, which have been shared since uh, until yesterday is yet yeah, 13 and a half million. So data consents were successfully delivered. And the number of accounts which have been linked on AA is approximately 12 million, you know, accounts uh, have been linked on you know, the account aggregator ecosystem it is a very good start but we still have a long way to go you know we have to start small and we have to grow you know actually in a phased uh, in a way because as the the usage increases uh, you know as the scaling happens also we need to ensure that all the technical systems at every hop at the aa fip fiu are scalable and they are able to deliver you know what they have to deliver so, uh, I mean, if you were to look at the adoption rate, uh, it's at around, uh, if you were to look at the whole population, it's at around 1.2, 1.5% of the total population. And yeah. if you were to look at the bank population, and we take the bank population to somewhere around 250 million Indians, it would be uh, slightly, uh, it, it's more than what, um, Six five to six percent. Uh, so five to six percent. Yeah. But I also want to say that for FY for FY twenty three, which ends in March twenty twenty three, the uh, the amount of loans which were dispersed using the account aggregator ecosystem was about six and a half thousand crores. Okay, by the NBFCs and the banks who used AA to uh, to give out the loans. So and these would be loans to. Uh, corporate entities or these are loaned to uh, individual I was, I, oh yeah okay i think i should have also said of that uh, six and a half thousand no more than 50 percent were for small businesses so th that is very important so i mean uh, uh, because the uh, initial uh, hypothesis behind creating account aggregators was that it would help small businesses procure loans uh, in an environment where they were not able to do so earlier because either because of lack of financial information or because of lack of credit history per se. So because right. I didn't have a loan earlier, I wouldn't get a loan, uh, you know, a new it's loan from a bank. So yeah. that's very heartening to see that, you know, at least 50% of them are SMBs. Now, uh, help us understand a little bit about how does the account aggregator fit into uh, these, you know, the India stack, and where does uh, what lies below it and what lies above it? So you have so three layers, as you know, uh, mainly in India stack. You know, you have the you have the identity layer in which you have uh, you know on the Aadhaar is there. Okay, then you have the payment layer, and one of the components is obviously the the UPI, and and the third is the data layer, of which account aggregator is or oh, you know one of the in the offerings in the data layer what is uh, you know important to note and which is fascinating is that each of these uh, layers work independently okay it is up to each of these applications like if uh, account aggregator um, the end use case not a directly 
if they want to use the UPI, they'll be able to use UPI. And obviously, when you're opening a, a bank account, you know, they may ask you, you know, for the verification of your, uh, you know, so KYC, etc. You, you know, where the first layer is used. So each of these are independent. And yeah, the end use case, you know, the, the, there is a very high chance they will, uh, you know, speak to each of the layers, okay, to deliver the, the end product. So the more and more they use each of the layers, I would say that higher the chance of the end-to-end -end journey to be completely digital. If you, if you don't use any one of the layers, you will be able to deliver the, the end use case. To give an example, I, I may be able to uh, apply for a loan, get approval using account aggregator. And if they don't use uh, UPI to uh, like uh, actually give the loan, you know, either they'll give a check, uh, you know, uh, you know, or use uh, RTGS, et cetera, you know, to give. So I'm telling if they wish to use, you have an option to use each of the layers of India stack, but it isn't mandatory. So, uh, and, you know, we've been hearing about certain other DPIs, like uh, at least from the iSpirit network, uh, uh, which combines uh, GST data, income tax data, uh, which currently does not reside with the banking system, but resides with the government systems. Uh, that being combined into the, uh, you know, for a full view of the uh, so-called financial profile of a business or an individual. Correct. Uh, so we, we we heard of a uh, uh, DPI called Badal. Uh, are you aware of Badal and its integration uh, progress? Yeah, I mean, the exact status, I, I won't be able to tell you. I mean, I will not be able to tell you about Badal, but you know you are right that uh, uh, you know the uh, when aa started it was for any entity which is registered and regulated by any of the four financial right. service regulators but now like about 15 days ago you would have seen the news that a gst schema also has been published for the account aggregator ecosystem which means the gst n will be an fip so I, as a small uh, business, when I apply for a loan, uh, I could share my GST invoices, which will give, uh, you know, the the view or I mean the okay pipeline view of my business, and the bank statements will actually you know show the the so status of the collections. So, so this you... is uh, happening. This will come. The GST data will come via account aggregators. Uh, yes, I mean, you have a choice. Either, the, you know, somebody will be able to, uh, you know, uh, you know, have it shared, you know, through a GSP or through the account aggregator. Okay, so, I mean, like, let's use, a, uh, let's give an example of a use case. Uh, I'm an SMB uh, owner and I have GST data, but right. I have no, I have no uh, past uh, credit history. Uh, right. but I have, so my GST data, I agree to share my GST data. Yes. Uh, the bank goes to uh, an, a licensed account aggregator right. and uh, that account aggregator now has my GST data, my uh, all my right. banking statements, all my banking data, all my insurance data, all my provident fund data, everything. Uh, and now it can technically give me a loan based off, on my uh, cash flow. Uh, loan correction there that the account aggregator is not having any of your information. Okay, it is exactly like in your UPI app. So, you know, when I have to explain, I always go back to UPI because everybody is very familiar with UPI. Because, you know, when you are about to make a payment using UPI, the UPI app is not having your money. It informs your bank that it should be made the payment. Account aggregator is also the same. When you go and apply for a loan uh, with a bank or NBFC, they are going to ask you for your account aggregator handle and uh, that bank will actually uh, you know go and inform your account aggregator that you have applied for a loan and they want your so gst period for uh, i mean uh, information for a particular period whether one month or six months 
and your bank statements are again say for you know for four months then the account aggregator rather the account aggregator with whom you have an account you have linked your accounts which is a very important point link your accounts your account aggregator will go to each fip like you, you know to uh, like, like after you after you give your consent rather that yes i am okay to share my gst data i am okay to share my uh, so bank statements from so these two banks which have linked then your account aggregator goes to each of the fips it will actually get the data and it will deliver it to the fiu which is uh, your the lending institution so the account aggregator has no information of yours and once the account aggregator has passed on all this information to the fiu it deletes the data so account aggregator has no uh, information of yours and even if they had saved which is against the rules all the information uh, which they have it can be it can be decrypted only by the fiu so it, what the information which goes through a is to, uh, you know a is not able to act and like actually decrypted hence we say the account aggregator is data blind yeah so that's very important to understand both from a privacy of data point of view and also from uh, you know where the data actually resides but it does reside with the lending institution and suppose yes. i decide not to take that loan uh, yes. what happened to that data which i have i have consented to give to the yes. lending institution is that also deleted or does that remain yes, sure. i'll explain that to you uh, so actually you know when that fiu uh, you know with whom you went and applied for a loan it sent uh, it asked the account aggregator for information it actually declares the purpose for which it is asking for your data and one very very important uh, field uh, which we have which is actually called data life for what period of time it is allowed to process the data okay so it, it uh, when you are applying for a loan it, it, it may be one week or 15 days after that 15 days that entity is not allowed to use your data okay but if their uh, respective regulator has a requirement that you need to save the, the data for six years eight years of every customer who came and applied for a loan they will have to save the data the other part which i want to say is only when account aggregator has actually come into the picture everybody is actually asking okay what happens to all my data which is a good thing you know people are asking but until now also you were you giving them the offline data you were giving the data with a hard copy and email but nobody was asking okay uh, you know uh, my my loan was not approved or i am not going with that institution for the loan what happens to my data okay you know which nobody was asking so now in a way account aggregator has made actually the people ask okay i care about my your yeah, privacy yeah it's, okay. it's an interesting evolution in even people concern about the data now, yeah, certainly <laughs> yeah, now in in this whole layers uh, uh, where does the dpi uh, depa plays a role uh, is depa being used DEPA extensively is actually a framework on how data it will be shared that it should be consented okay and if you use the if you use the mitis consent artifact which says that you will have a purpose code you will have the data uh, life and if it is a one time consent it is a if it is a recurring consent so all these principles are actually uh, explained in like actually in depa which says that you can share any kind of data but it should be consented account aggregator is only an instantiation of the depa framework it is the financial uh, uh you know either you can say financial instantiation or a or a fork of the uh, you know of that framework but it is only for the financial data so if we were to look at it visually we have the stack which are the, yeah. which are the three uh, layers so to say you know you yeah. have the you have the identity but layer the payments, the bottom, yeah. you have the banking uh, jandhan account layer at the at the center and then you have the uh, payment layer on top 
and then you have so called the adhar uh, the account aggregator which is through the depa uh, layer interacting with financial institutions at one land and with the individuals uh, uh, what protocol are they using to interact with the uh, individuals is there a specific protocol uh, that they're using to suppose i i am no, no. with the uh, yeah, yeah. Currently, I mean, no, no. The way it is, is it is using the okay public internet HTTPS, okay, or okay to interact with each of the institutions. It's not using Beacon protocol to interact. Uh... The Beacon is for something else. See, this is for data sharing only. Okay, Beacon is like you know, you know, for your democratizing commerce. So that's a separate protocol. Okay. So, but but uh, since you have actually brought it up. It is like each of uh, uh, these UPI, AA, uh, you know, UPI, AA, so backend, etc., will be able to work with each other, but they are not dependent upon each other. Correct. That's very important to know, especially for the te technical minded and also for people who are thinking about these frameworks. Uh, now let's take this to a slightly uh, 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 tangential uh, this thing. Account aggregator is using the DEPA framework uh, basically to uh, understand what consent the individual has given. And it okay. is sharing the data with the FIO, which is the lending institution. Uh, uh, the full form of FIO is financial uh, information user. Financial, financial information user, which would be a lending institution. Or yes. maybe uh, an institution. Financial member. planner. Uh, it, uh, it can be uh, insurance, AMC. Okay. All those. So now, DEPA also, in, in a sense, you know, that therefore is guaranteeing that whatever consent I have given or whatever uh, rules I have set for sharing my information are yes. followed by uh, an ecosystem. Yes, you're right. Uh, now, th this is a very important development according to us in this uh, in the data world. Because yeah. the DEPA then, if it is used for financial information, it can also be used for other information. For like health, for travel, uh, education. For even for age consent access to internet, you know, like uh, uh, like like for pornography site insists that, you know, you have to be 18 years and above. A gaming, online gaming site uh, insists that you should be, you know, X years above. Um, why is... DEPA not being uh, uh, enabled or uh, should I say its application hmm. not being uh, enlarged uh, in other usages on the internet. Say that it is up to each of the ecosystems to look at it and say, yes, you know, we want to, like it should be used. See, now, now, now example, you have the, your foundational, uh, so DPIs. I mean, you 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 have GPS on which you have Google Maps built. You have an SMTP on which you know several email clients are there, either Gmail, your Thunderbird, or any of those. So now, account aggregator, for example, or any of those are okay. The foundational so DPIs. Now it is up to the ecosystem from each of the fields to pick it up and say it should be used. Okay, so like including, like example, travel, like if I say that if you want to be able to share, you know, all your so trips information, it can be used. If you want to share, you know, your uh, so health records, you know, uh, it can be used. So I, I would say that each of the, any of the, uh, you know, how to say, like, you know, uh, so Sahabati is for the financial ecosystem. Now, uh, it is being used. So in the same way, I mean, you have SWAS, you know, which is for health. In the same way, if there are other entities which are focused uh, on a, a particular uh, space, they all should look into DEPA and saying we should implement it. So, th so that's a voluntary implementation that, you know, uh, you're talking about. Uh, voluntary, as you know, is not a, uh, <laughs> is not an easy thing for most Market participants to it's take. Not a it's not a startup. Yeah. So you you, know, you finally you need some regulatory body to come in, step in, and say that uh, hey guys, uh, we've given you time for voluntary 
usage now you need to do it through directive usage uh, see it will come in my opinion also because uh, you know it occurred to me say that you know uh, you know once you have the your digital data privacy bill passed which gives the right to every individual or 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 a business okay uh, the capability to share their in information data with anybody they want so an fip or the um, the your data fiduciary which has your data is obligated to make it easy for you to be able to share the data you know with a consent so when everybody needs to implement it okay uh, you know, instead of reinventing the wheel they might also well look into if something is already in the market which has been gone live if it has been tested and if it is working well they can implement the same in a particular vertical so uh, let's take a hypothetical case here uh, there is uh, you know uh, the government is very keen to curb uh, online betting uh, and they feel that online betting has to be curbed both from an age perspective and from a uh, misuse or overuse perspective okay okay uh, i say and it has been asking you know state governments have banned it uh, central government is saying that there needs to be a regulatory body is it foreseeable in the near future that um, a sahmati kind of an organization or sahmati itself is applied as a framework uh, on online betting where it says that consent will be uh, given your age will be determined by the system and the amount of money that you can use or uh, misuse on that platform will be governed by uh, either maximum limits minimum limits or you know your bank account limit. Maximum especially okay yeah. especially yeah. maximum limit i mean uh, i mean i for sure don't foresee myself getting involved in the online betting <laughs> okay something uh, you know i'm not able to gel with at all okay frankly but uh, you know like i would say that uh, you know a use case which you have actually brought up is the age verification but in this case uh, also your uh, you know uh, your financial capability or your uh, your limit uh, so based on all your financial bank statements so, or so, so somebody is able to determine you know or, or how much of it you are able to spend on a particular thing but I'm not sure if the your constitutional uh, thing will actually actually step in rights that who are you to tell me I can spend every day only 100 rupees or not 150 rupees. I mean, I'm not sure about that. I mean, how that works because yeah. for uh, ev everything you will have a lawyer who will actually fight for you. Uh, yeah. But, you know, like you have you a know, what, what about What about time? You know, uh, atten you know attention is a increasingly expensive commodity on internet and uh, increasingly it is being soaked up by uh, different forms of uh, uh, different platforms you know like for instance an ott platform sucks in uh, say eight percent of your time on a daily basis a gaming platform says sucks in 15 to 20 percent or even 50 percent in case of a teenager leads to depression anxiety and all those things yes. Uh, and this is also a form of uh, resource. It's a resource and it's a consent. I may uh, be a, uh, I may not be a major or I'm uh, and I'm a major. using I've given consent for playing, but yes. I've not given consent to the platform to ensnare me into addictive behavior for a fifty percent of my resources. Right. So, like for instance, uh, you know, China is not a great example for all democratic uh, accesses, but it has limited time in terms of access for gaming. But it has not done it uh, through technology. It has insisted the market players uh, prevent usage. Okay, uh, we, have, uh, we have actually developed technology without developing policy, you know? Yeah. So our policy, our technology is moving ahead of our policy and but in a, in a right and proper manner, especially yes. for digital public goods. Yes. There is nothing to curb attention in today's world. And attention uh, for the, this generation is possibly the most, um, what can I say, precious resource. Yes. Uh, I, do you see Sahamati kind of institution playing a role in terms of governing attention? We can't govern, I would say. But I, I mean, we as in sense, uh, you know, for sure not Sahamati. 
but Sarmati, Ladakh and institution, if they set up actually the, the framework where with the consent of the end customer, okay, uh, uh, they are automatically, uh, you know, uh, they're able to share the amount of time they've spent, you know, when they use on phone, when they use on laptop, OTT, automatically all information is actually going to one place. And from there, uh, you know, you, you get the warning as a whole, uh, you know, for the whole day, you have already burnt, you know, uh, your entire digital quota, okay, that, you know, you have to take a break. But here the, uh, I would say the focus is the consent, okay, we, with your thing, everything is shared, number one, but okay, then everybody is also afraid because all your information of each your platform, how it is being used is stored somewhere, okay, now, uh, you know, uh, how safe is it? Is it um, accessible only to the algorithm and not the human being who is behind that entity? So all those questions will come, but which is solvable? In my it opinion, is solvable, it is solvable in a, if it is, uh, if it is not sitting in a government entity, but it's sitting in a digital public good kind of a infrastructure where yes. the uh, access is not to private institution or to government institution. You know, th this is very important. Uh, and it is also very important uh, from a, and I I would say that consent is not given only just by the individual. Consent is given by regulation uh, that this is the limit imposed, and both the individual and the, the gaming entities or any other platform uh, have to therefore follow it. You know how do how does the government make uh, uh, sure that you know. People are not wasting the time. A young 13 year to 19 year old uh, minds are not wasting the time on uh, yeah. OTTs and this thing. And this is a concern now world over, you know. Uh, but but there, really there are no agree. frameworks uh, which have come up. There is a lot of discussion around policy, but nothing around frameworks and technology. You see, there are two ways to implement these things, I believe, uh, in a fast moving technology world. One is that you develop policy, which is generally with a lag effect of three years or five years behind the technology. The other is you actually develop technology which keeps pace with the development, yeah. which is what India has been doing. No? We are we're moving yeah. ahead of uh, technology by developing DPIs which keep pace uh, through APIs and you know the protocol itself that becomes policy. It's been fantastic so last 10 years or, uh, you know, or so approximately eight, nine years, India has actually shown yeah, we uh, moved ahead of the curve, you know, we moved ahead. Have, of the, uh, see, curve. I would say that if you have any of, you know, all these uh, frameworks and the thing, and it is shown as a, a digital public good, which is good for the society, it will be, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it will be seen actually in a good way. But the moment you add a, a mandatory uh, thing, right, lens, okay, everybody will start jumping around. Okay, so I think you may, I, I think like if the product is actually uh, very, very good, okay, then the parents automatically will obviously, uh, you know, show interest or because after all, everybody is interested in the, so well-being, uh, you know, of the child. Yeah, but the show is uh, anyway, I think to speak about that topic, you need another podcast. <laughs> we'll be moving away from financial inclusion to family inclusion so let's not get into that but no financial inclusion to digital well-being yeah and i think yeah, uh, is, you know i think it is a very important topic and i'm sure you will find few entities and actually people you know who will be okay to get involved in fact i would say that the the actually the gaming industry itself should actually participate in this yeah i believe so i believe yeah. so you're, you're very right that because it's better to lead the uh, change rather than you know uh, bleed the change so to say <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh, uh, now coming back to uh, Samuti, uh we are uh, Samuti is not a licensed entity uh, they, they are we are a profit body we are not for profit section 8 who are working on growing the account aggregator ecosystem by working with everybody who were is involved indirectly or directly with the ecosystem. So it is the FIPs, account aggregators, FIUs, technology service providers, your policy makers. We work with everybody, okay, uh, with all of them to make it happen. Our uh, interest is to uh, make sure that the end 
your customers' interests are actually taken care. So, so you representing in the interest of the end consumer or yes. the ecosystem? No, no. I mean, we have to work with everybody. I mean, uh, you know, you, you we cannot work only saying that uh, we we work only for the end customer, and uh, you know, you, you know, we you know, we start ha having fights with the ecosystem. We have to work with each other and ensure that it is it is actually fair for everybody. So, uh, how do you? How do you see the so-called adoption improving or changing over the next five years? Tell us what are the triggers uh, we should keep in mind, which would tell us that, like, you know, uh, UPI really took off, didn't take off in the first three, four years, if you remember. Yes. Uh, people say demonetization was a great driver for UPI. So no, I think the, the bigger driver was uh, COVID and uh, there was another driver that when all the payment banks, uh, all the payment entities came on board, you know, yes. suddenly the, the, the existing marketplace was bigger than the individual platform marketplace. And that became a, a driver. And I think there was a little nudge at that point in time by both RBI and NPCI that, you know, this is the way to go. Uh, yeah. There was no mandatory policy, the thing, but there were nudges, uh, soft nudges, hard nudges, whatever you might want to call yeah. that, which enabled that to happen. Uh, how do you see this You know, scenario kind of uh, so, replicating uh, itself in the account aggregator world? See, I think it is very important for a, everybody to see that you know when any new DPI is uh, going to be launched, like account aggregator or even if you actually take uh, anything else in the commerce space, if you, you see, you know, you know, ONDC, they, I mean, they, they all have started the journey now. So it is, it is not yeah, possible that within one month of something going live, it will scale up, uh, you know, the way everybody wants. You know, everything yeah. happens in a very, very so phased manner. Now, you know, we have like 300 and odd entities who are on account aggregator ecosystem. So are we happy about it? Yes, we are happy about it. Okay, but uh, you know, like, so is there any way we can stop our work? Obviously not, because the number of entities who are eligible to be part of AA ecosystem is almost 10,000 entities. Okay, so we still have a long way to go, but we can have excellent growth. We can have uh, the, uh, the, Scaling also will be strong and it won't be fragile if the if the foundation is very strong. So we are in that phase now. We are working with all the large entities and uh, you know like I mean uh, and everybody is on live. I mean who are yeah, technically uh, you know savvy entities etc. To ensure the way it is scaling is uh, actually happening in a you know. Uh, a dependable way in the sense that you see the yeah, success rate the SLAs have to be good. So like in now in UPI when you make a payment, it has to go through. So account aggregator as of now is at to reach where it should be. So it has started now. It has had uh, we have seen some the teething problems, you know. But the beauty is that every entity is working with us to see how to solve for this teething problem. So, so where, where, where do you think the tipping point uh, lies? I think the tipping point uh, lies when all the your public sector banks and the private top banks, they successfully integrate the account aggregator pipe into every product of theirs. Okay, currently each one has, I mean, each one has launched in a couple of uh, uh, things only products, which in my opinion is the right strategy because they will want to yeah, test it out with a few products, see if it is uh, if something has to be changed, something has to be so fine tuned, and once they have it right, then you yeah, take it to all their products. So it has to happen with all the large entities, and you will see with all the. Yeah, technically savvy young entities. You have, you know, many NBFCs who are technically savvy. 
will be able to scale this in a very, very big way. So for me personally, I, I, you know, when, if you ask me, when, when do I feel that Sarmati has delivered? It is not the number of entities which have gone live on AA. When I come to know if a street vendor or an auto rickshaw driver was able to apply for a loan using the account aggregator framework, you know, without even visiting a branch, it is only uh, then for me it'll be that uh, it'll be a you know a satisfying you know in the moment that it has delivered. So would it be uh, you know we are one of the few countries in the world which has an account aggregator framework without having a digital banking license or an open banking license, uh, and there is a school of thought which says that while uh, public sector banks and private sector banks will uh, move at a pace a digital bank might move, a native digital bank will move at a much faster pace in terms of integrating or in, in terms of even launching each product with an account aggregator embedded in it, you know. Yes. And that adoption will, uh, you know, uh, finally enable a tipping point or so to be reached quicker than it would happen with, uh, you know, so just imagine the UPI without the payment uh, wallet. Uh, UPI only with you know the public sector banks and private sector banks trying to do an RTGS in the internet world, you know. Um, yes. so that's where the account aggregators framework currently is, in, in my uh, humble opinion. But um, and I see a digital bank, a native digital bank um, being the typical point. Uh, no, but you, over here, what is I, your I, thing? Yeah, see, over here, I would, yeah, it actually. It depends upon the financial product, for example. Okay, now if you want to be you're taking a loan, etc., the your cheapest uh, rate which you actually get is from the largest institution. It is not, you know, from a small institution. So over here, it becomes important that all sizes of institutions, you know, they come on AA and every product of uh, the, theirs. Michael, I'll, I'll back, I beg to differ there very strongly. Uh, we've yeah. done the study and we realized that uh, the cost of capital uh, for a traditional mm -hmm. bank, a public sector bank, is the highest. The cost of capital for a private sector bank is lower. The cost of capital for a, for, uh, a new bank um, would be cheapest, not because of the uh, they're able to raise capital at a cheaper rate, because their institutional cost is cheaper. So, so if I have a branchless digital bank, my cost is actually lower than will be lower than all the incumbents from day one because my cost of operations is lower. Cost of yeah. operations of a branch banking is around 18% of the cost of a bank. In, mm. a, in a branch NBFC, the cost of uh, branch is between 18 to 22%. So okay. uh, uh, somehow this kind of, uh, uh, and this is a large, these are large costs, which does not arise in a digital bank or a digital native digital finance operations, you know. And RBI is kind of holding back this rain too hard, you know, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, oh, so I believe that they, they might come a bank that time that, you know, differential banking would be more digital banking there than. So you know. that is the beauty of the, the account aggregator framework. I would say it makes it yeah, possible for the end customer to easily shop for, you know, for any of the financial products you know, at the best rate, okay, sitting at home. Now, now, the hardest part now in the offline world is you need to either email or need to go to the branch, you know, across and apply. Okay, now you sitting here, I'm able to apply to the traditional banks and the digital entities and see who gives me the best rate. Yeah. But I, I'll, I'll pose another use case for you. You know, a use case which, is, which troubles uh, non-profits like us. Do you know no bank in the country gives a non-profit a credit card or a, a card that can be used? No, no uh, bank in the uh, give the non-profit a, a, a you know a working capital uh, in spite of knowing the cash flows that are coming in. Like you know they can see traditionally the the non-profits are actually kept out of the banking system. Okay. It's interesting. Uh, we are like the we are like the street vendors uh, who don't have uh, a, you know a predictable uh, cash flow, but we do have a cash flow. Uh, but the banking system believes that we are not bankable. 
Um, and that makes that makes uh, so life so difficult for organizations like ours. Uh, I, I, we we hope that you know somewhere the account aggregators also takes our financial information and you know makes it sure all yeah. these yeah, banking but, products. But, 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 honestly, it is difficult. But as you said, that at least you are able now to easily you are able to share your financial data yeah. and see if it works. Yeah, sure, great. It's great talking to you, Mahesh. Um, I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk again. And uh, yeah. thank you for your inputs uh, on the account aggregator. I we wish you all the luck, and we, we wish Sahmati uh, the thank best. We, we need all the, we need you know all the support and all the good wishes. You know by which to the, you know to the large population. Best thank of luck you. on that. Thank you very much.